Are viruses alive or not? Or something in between? Well, today I'm going to show you that the answer is clearly yes. They are 100% alive. And here's why. This question has been debated for three centuries now, and the answer keeps evolving. If you do a quick search today, and I highly recommend you do, the answer you'll find almost everywhere is simply no. Viruses are not alive. Some might use vague language, such as they're in a gray area, or that they are on the edge of life, whatever that means. Here's celebrity YouTuber Dr. Eric Burke six okay. months ago. Why can't we kill a virus? Okay, well, it's because viruses are not alive in the first place. They're a piece of genetic material, very mysterious, wrapped in a sack. Very mysterious and wrapped in a sack. Now he's reflecting mainstream thinking today, and I like Dr. Eric, who's by the way, a chiropractor. But even most biologists and virologists consider viruses to be non-living and give different explanations for that. There is, however, a minority that believe they are alive. Now I get it why even scientists have a hard time answering this question. A lot depends on how we define life. There are more than 200 competing definitions, but no real consensus. Also, our understanding of viruses and our definition of life has changed and evolved with time. From 1892, when the first virus was discovered causing tobacco leaf disease, first thought to be a poison and hence the Latin name virus. In the early 20th century, it was thought to be a living organism because it can cause disease. But in 1935, it was demoted to non-living or just inert biological chemicals. And this still stands today. So the first viruses discovered were quite small and simple. Many had a very tiny genome or genetic information that barely coded for a few proteins. They don't have a cell wall, but their genetic information is inside a protective layer called capsid. They don't have the usual components essential for cells to function. And lastly, they can't reproduce on their own. So according to the current definition, since viruses don't have cells, can't make or metabolize and store energy, can't reproduce on their own, then they can't be alive. So if you look at any tree of life, you won't find viruses. Eukaryotes means that they have a true nucleus and includes humans, animals, plants, and fungi. Bacteria don't have a true nucleus, so they are a class on their own. And the more recently discovered and poorly understood RK. This is another tree of life, and again, does not include viruses. Now, based on what's available out there, I think there's a story that has to be told. I will argue that the answer is clear, and it is a resounding yes. Viruses are 100% alive, and I'm going to give three examples as evidence. But first, some quick background. First, we need to understand that viruses have two phases in their life cycle. And yes, I did say life cycle. And this phase you see right here is how we usually know viruses. It is called the varian which is the complete virus outside of cells. Now, this is the phase thought to be non-alive. But once they're inside a cell, they are very much alive and fulfill all criteria for life. Now, many believe this is the real virus inside of cells, and the first phase is just how it spreads. See, the first phase resembles pollens, fungal or bacterial spores, and seeds more than they resemble living cells. It is a dormant form that can resist outside environment until conditions improve. Now, all these are considered alive, but dormant. Now, a man lost in a desert with no food or water might die in two weeks. He can't make energy. He can't reproduce on his own. Does that mean he's not alive? No, he just depends on his environment, just like all living organisms do. So back to this page. This is the stage we think is non-living. And based on what you heard so far, you'd think these viruses are just chemical genetic material floating randomly and causing illness. Please keep this thought in mind as I introduce you to my first guest and a, a real rock star. May I present you with my first argument. The T4 bacteriophage, or phage for short. They are so amazing that they should be enough to convince you on their own. Bacteriophages are viruses that kill or eat bacteria, and T4 is one type. There are more phages on Earth than all other organisms combined. They are the single deadliest entity on our planet because they are responsible for the majority of deaths on Earth every day. But don't worry, they don't harm humans. They actually are buddies. 
They look like a lunar lander or an alien spaceship or an android. It doesn't look like simple random floating genetic information, does it? But wait, there's much more. It has a head, an icosahedral, that is with 20 faces and 30 edges, has a neck, a tail, long contractile fibers like legs to help with landing and binding receptors, also has short tail fibers that act like teeth. And if you thought it looks like a creature with a face and body and legs, you're not alone. This is a look-alike toy and actually looks cute. It was first discovered in London in 1915, but we're still trying to fully understand it today. Now, remember what we said about the first stage of viruses when it's outside the cell and the phase considered not to be alive? Here's a recent animation from Purdue University based on the latest research and knowledge we have of how T4 phages attack and infect their host or prey, in this case E. coli. This video by itself should make anyone change their mind. Look at the sequence of events and judge if it looks random or alive. Here are more illustrations. Again, attacking E. coli. Now let's look at some real scanning electron microscope images. Of course, all these colors are used for enhancing purposes only. They only kill bacteria and don't affect humans. It's currently being researched and studied to kill superbugs that are multi-drug resistant and will likely be one of the treatments of the future. By the way, it was successfully used to treat a patient with multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter, which is extremely hard to treat. Here's another study that just came out April 16, 2020 of nebulized bacteriophages for the treatment of MRSA ventilator-associated pneumonia in mice and showed significant benefits. There are, however, a lot of restrictions on using it for fear of introducing a new species to humans. The time it takes the T4 phage from entering the bacteria to causing death is 30 minutes. They start replicating after 12 minutes. Quite efficient. I want to end with this image. I want you to imagine a rover on Mars took a soil sample and examined it under the microscope and found these images and sent them back. My question to you, would you say this is something alive or dead? Does it look random to you? This cartoon says it all. You look alive. Nope, it's just your imagination. And for reference, here are some shapes of bacteria and viruses. None look random to me, but both look like life forms. Moving on to the second argument. One of the reasons we were confused at the beginning is that we only found the smaller and simpler viruses, so we didn't really appreciate their diversity and complexity. But recent discoveries in virology changed that forever. First was the discovery of mimivirus, short for microbe mimicking virus. They are giants in the viral world. It has more genes than a lot of bacteria. It performs functions that normally happen only in cellular organisms. The first giant virus, the mimivirus, was discovered in 2003 by the famous French virologist Dr. Didier Raoul. By the way, he published the first study using hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for the treatment of COVID-19 over a month ago. Their diameter is around 700 nanometers, whereas most viruses are less than 200 nanometers. You can actually see these viruses under a regular light microscope, which is quite amazing. In fact, they were isolated back in 1993 in Bradford, England, but they were mistaken for bacteria. They have a huge genome, bigger than many bacteria at 1.2 million base pairs. So much for simple organisms. These genes encode for complex proteins and structures never seen in viruses before, including genes involved in the metabolism of sugar, lipids, and proteins. This is an illustration of the outer shape. Another illustration of the structure. 
But that was just the beginning. Once they knew what to look for, they found an even larger virus that they appropriately called mama virus. And again, discovered by Dr. Raoul. But the big surprise was the discovery of a smaller virus named Sputnik vi virophage because it's considered a satellite virus. It was inside a mama virus infecting it. This was the first evidence of a virophage, that is, a virus infecting another virus. See, Sputnik doesn't replicate well in amoeba cells, but once the amoeba is infected by mama virus, Sputnik can thrive and multiply within the viral factory created by the mama virus. And this comes at the expense of the mama virus because its production becomes less abnormal and defective. So they get sick. So how can you get infected and get sick if you aren't even alive? Not only that, Sputnik virus, which is a DNA virus, contains genes from mama virus, indicating it's involved in gene transfer between species, and so contributing to the evolutionary process. This is an article in Nature in 2008 about this, with the conclusion, there's no doubt that this is a living organism. The fact that it can get sick makes it more alive. And now comes the biggest virus in the world, with a diameter of a whopping 750 nanometers and a DNA genome of over 2 million base pairs discovered in 2013. I give to you the amoeba infecting Pandora virus, and it surely opened Pandora's box, maybe the fourth dimension of life. Discovered in France in this pond and also found in Australia and elsewhere, when they looked at its genes, 93% were unlike anything else seen in any organism on this planet, including viruses, meaning they represent a different evolutionary pathway. We have no clue where its ancestors came from. Now to show you how odd that is, let's compare our genes and see how much we share with other species. See, a lot of these genes share the same biological function in all species. Try to guess what percentage do we have in common with chimpanzees. 96%. How about our fairy friends, the cats? 90%. Mice, is it possible? Yes, 85%. The same. Even a fruit fly? 61%. And last but not least, yes, bananas. Guess how much we have in common with them? 60%. Here's a more surprising fact. How much of our human genome comes from viruses? Not just similar, but actually came from viruses that infected our ancestors. The answer is more than 8%. Back to Pandora, so 93% unique genes. They can actually create their own genes and proteins all the time, which defies standard biology. This is one published study showing that. By the way, there are now many recognized giant viruses but they have different genes and they are not much related to each other. They're bridging the gap between bacteria and viruses and suggest life is continuous and that we should redefine our understanding of life. But wait, there's a lot more. We're now discovering that viruses have their own immune system under their control and it adapts to the surrounding environment. In 2019, Tufts University School of Medicine came across a particular strain of bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. This virus literally stole the immune system of the cholera bacteria and used it against it to replicate and eventually kill the bacteria. And it integrated their immune system and passed it on to their offsprings. All this started making scientists think twice about this question. Are viruses alive? New evidence says yes. Now switching gears, let's look at the last, the largest pandemics in history and how many were caused by viruses. In 1918, the Spanish flu killed about 5 to 10% of the entire human population. These are other influenza outbreaks that killed over 1 million. HIV killed over 35 million. These are other viruses and the coronaviruses. Of course, COVID deaths now are over a quarter of a million and exp expected to reach over one million. Now look at these viruses causing large-scale disruption, illness, and death and wreaking havoc in the world. Which brings us to the last but not least argument, the COVID-19 virus pandemic. This novel virus has spread around the world in two months. 
So do you think it can travel well? Now let's remember, these viruses including the coronavirus and influenza use hosts like birds, bats and humans which helps carry them and spread them all over the world. Do you think this is caused by a non-living organism? Now, most scientists and journalists seem to think so. No, coronavirus isn't even alive, declares an expert. Washington Post article, March 23rd. The coronavirus isn't alive, that's why it's so hard to kill. Why can't we kill the coronavirus? Because it's not alive in the first place. Now to be clear, you can definitely kill a virus with UV light, with heat, alcohol, detergents, etc. And that's an argument that it is alive. How can you kill something that isn't alive? Now, here are some closing arguments of why viruses are 100% alive. Now, sure, viruses can't reproduce on their own, but look at the end result. Are they about to go extinct? Viruses are the most successful species on Earth from that standpoint, and they are found everywhere, in oceans, on land, everywhere. Viruses are ancient, and at least as old as insects and animals. They can infect all species on Earth. They are by far the most abundant biological entity on Earth, and is 10 times more frequent than bacteria. They evolved and adapted, and are thriving quite well, thank you. So are viruses alive or not? Some say it's a philosophical question, not a scientific one. Some say it depends on the definition of life. And sure, there are many things we still don't understand today. But in 2020, we need to acknowledge viruses as part of life, even if different from what we think we know life is. And if it doesn't fit into our definition of life, maybe we should change that definition. And they should definitely be included in the tree of life. This can improve our understanding of evolution and help scientists invent drugs, make crops more productive and resistant to infectious diseases. Viruses are also responsible for many forms of cancer and autoimmune diseases, by the way. And they are an important component of the human microbiome. Some have suggested a classification for the use for the tree of life and included viruses as capsid encoding versus ribosome encoding organisms because they have the genetic information in their capsid but not the ribosomes to make these proteins. This is definitely not mainstream today. And finally, how are we going to look for extraterrestrial life on other planets if we can't find life here on Earth? I hope you found this useful and interesting and stimulating to read more. Let me know what you think, whether you agree or disagree, and thank you for watching. Thank you.